Welcome back. In the previous lecture, we discussed the importance of standardization in systems of systems. Now, we'll focus on the interconnections. In tightly coupled, interconnected systems, a disturbance happening in some part of the system may have far-reaching consequences. If the disturbance cannot be contained and remediated at the local level, it will cascade through the network and affect the service level in a wider region. This is what happens in a power blackout. And if a blackout occurs, it may be very hard to restart the system again because of the tight couplings between subsystems. In countries where the supply of electricity cannot keep up with increasing demand, system operators will try to prevent blackouts by planned demand curtailment in parts of the network. And this is what is called a brownout. The system operator may inform you that your neighborhood will be out of power for certain hours on certain days, and during the hours that your neighborhood is supplied, other neighborhoods will be curtailed. And you know by experience that being out of power severely limits you in doing the things you want to do. And I think all of us under understand how detrimental it is to the economy. Which is very evident when you think about all the economic activities that depend on electricity. The electricity infrastructure is a so-called critical infrastructure. If malfunctioning, society and the economy will be disrupted. Uh, electrified trains will come to a standstill. So at this point, let me take the notion of systems of systems to another level. That is to the level of interconnections and interactions between infrastructures in different sectors. The definition of critical infrastructure varies between countries, but in all cases includes electricity and telecommunications as the most critical infrastructures, which all other critical infrastructures depend upon. Emergency services, financial services, public health services, agriculture and food supply and many other sectors, including government, cannot be maintained for any sustained period of time without electricity and telecommunications. However, electricity and telecom infrastructures themselves use resources that are in part provided by other infrastructures. To supply telecom services, the telecommunication system uses not only electricity, but it also uses water and natural gas, to name just a few of the required infrastructure-related services. At the same time, the electricity infrastructure uses telecom services, but it also uses water, to name a uh, few of the resources that are vital to the electricity infrastructure. So, in other words, there is a high level of interdependency between infrastructure systems across different sectors. And these interdependencies come in various types. Physical or functional interdependencies exist when resources are physically exchanged, when the resources produced by some infrastructure are used by another infrastructure to produce its own resources and the other way around. Geographic interdependencies occur as a consequence of geographic proximity between infrastructures, so that a specific problem, uh, for example a fire or a pipeline burst in one infrastructure, can adversely affect other infrastructure. Digital interdependencies are related to the exchange of data on computer systems or to sharing data on um, control systems. And then we have logical interdependencies and organizational dependencies, uh, which are related to uh, organizational context or to market realities. The web of interdependencies between critical and less critical infrastructures creates a highly complex system of systems in which the failure of a single element or a single resource may cause a domino effect that affects all critical infrastructures in a region and that could bring the entire region to a standstill. 
many governments have been working and are still working on strategies to reduce their vulnerability to outages of critical infrastructures. Critical functions such as hospitals are very well aware of their dependence on electricity and they have installed backup generation capacity such as batteries or diesel fueled generators so that they can keep going in the event of a power blackout. However, in the case of a prolonged outage, the supply of diesel will become a bottleneck. And I think you can imagine that a study of those interdependencies, from first order to second order interdependencies and so on, is a hell of a job. And that these interdependencies vary widely between different locations. For example, Whereas in some places, such as in the Netherlands, the entire drinking water system needs electrical pumps, it is gravity-based in other places. And such places would therefore be far less vulnerable to power outages, at least as far as drinking water supply is concerned. The vulnerability of the system of infrastructure systems can be reduced in many ways. For example, by keeping strategic reserves of critical resources, by building redundancy in critical conversion units, for example, by installing parallel units uh, with one always in the standby mode, or by building redundancy in the transportation network in such a way that if one pathway gets blocked, the service can still be delivered through an alternative pathway. The latter strategy refers to the network topology about which you will learn more in the next weeks. Please note that all these measures require substantial investment, which makes, it, which makes it unlikely that such measures will be taken just for the sake of a very low probability event, even if the consequences of that low probability event may be disastrous. The system of systems character of infrastructure systems, both within and across infrastructure sectors, implies that strategies to avoid or recover from a breakdown require a multitude of actors to interact, including infrastructure owners and operators, producers of infrastructure resources, service providers and the government. Some of these sectors, some of these actors, I should say, will probably be based in the private sector, others in the public sector, implying that they are subject to different incentive systems and possibly different rules. Especially since most infrastructure providers are incentivized to pursue their own economic interests, the interdependencies across infrastructure sectors are unlikely to be properly managed without government intervention. I hope this gave you something to think about. Thank you.